Welcome back, Military Vehicle Technology Foundation and our tour part two of an early model M4A1. Uh, okay, it's a grizzly, but who's keeping track? Now, the first thing you'll note as you're looking at the turret is that there is no loader's hatch, which is what you might call a surprising omission. In fact, the real thing is, what on earth were they thinking? Now, in fairness to them, they were still learning. And if you look at the M3 medium, that didn't have a loader's hatch either, but it was a smaller turret. The problem, of course, you can imagine. If you've got to get out of the tank in a hurry for some reason, like, I don't know, the tank is on fire, uh, it's a bit difficult if you don't have a hatch of your own. What is perhaps less excusable was it took a year and a half uh, of production and about a year's worth of combat experience before somebody finally figured out how to drill a hole in the roof of the turret and install a hatch. These started coming off the production lines October 43. Now, there was a retrofit kit put out. So if you were in the field and you had a no-hatch Sherman, you could get this uh, kit that would come out. It will tell you, make a hole here in the turret roof and install this hatch, and the loaders became much happier. But still, it was a surprising omission. Uh, also surprising was the idea didn't die. If you look at the Merkava 4, the Israeli tank, uh, the early models of that looks like, they did not come with a loader's hatch. Uh, doubtless, this proved unpopular, as is evidenced by the fact that after a very brief period of time, the tank started appearing with loader's hatches. It's a structural weakness, but you got to give the crew a chance. Other features around the turret. Speaking of hatches, this is not the original hatch that came with an early 75mm tank. This was the originally the split hatch. Simply two pieces of simple metal that came up. There would be a single rotating periscope in one of them, and that's how you would see out. Very unsatisfactory. It also had a mount for the caliber 50 on the ring. Now, what it turned out happened was that the vision cupola was the same diameter as that of the split hatch. So it was actually very easy to take the vision cupola and put it in place at a split hatch, and all of a sudden you have a much, much better hatch. So, for example, this one now has an azimuth ring if you needed it for some reason, as well as the periscope. Simple, easy hatch to come down. The split hatches kept going quite a way through the war. They did start installing springs to make them easier to open in the middle of 43. Uh, still, uh, the Grizzlies, as near as you can tell, they all came out with originally the split hatch design. There was also the British Vision Cupola, which is a very good design, uh, but obviously the Americans didn't use it. As you move further around, you got the mounting point for the Caliber 50, which has now been moved back and left. The machine gun, of course, could only be fired really by somebody at standing on the back deck, so not really useful for the crew. This is a rest for the barrel, so the gun would be resting forward and horizontally this way. Just latch it out of the way, put it down, and you can see the spotlight. It could be controlled from within the tank, the loader had a handle, or it could be dismounted and handheld in a pistol grip that the commander has. If you move forward, we see the commander's vein sight, and this is used simply to gauge direction as he's telling the gunner to spin onto a target. He knows roughly which way the gunner is looking. Speaking of the gun, you'll see that there are very large screws at the front. This was done for modularity. The idea was that you could turn the tank into pretty much any required configuration by simply swapping out the gun, undo the bolts, and install module A, module B. Not in the field. I mean, once it left the factory, the idea was it was the same thing, but you could very easily swap it out on a production line. And these would be anything from the 57 millimeter, 75, the 105, or they were hoping for the three inch. Didn't work out. We'll come back to that story at a future point. That's pretty much the outside of the turret roof, so uh, now let's go inside. So now moved inside where the commander will be seated. I'm on a fold down seat. It's a very simple lift latch, fold down. Uh, if I wanted to be seated with my head out, there is actually an additional platform down here, which I have folded out of the way. It is cozy in here. The breech recoil guard is taking up a lot of my space and I've had to place one leg on either side of the gunner seat. Uh, not a good start. 
controls as he's going around. Well, if he's going to have a override handle here, a push forward for left, back for right, and all this is is a simple physical cable that goes all the way down and moves the gunner's control handle, which then moves the rest of the system. Very useful for getting a gunner onto target quickly. You don't have to yell at them to go left, right, hey, you missed it, you've gone too far, you're other left. I'm sure you're familiar with it, some of you. As you start moving around, underneath is a pistol grip for the spotlight. So you would dismount it from the position on the front of the turret and put it on here and you can wave around and see whatever it is it needs seeing. To see out, speaking of seeing, the six vision blocks on the direct vision uh, cupola. So again, early tanks did not have this vision cupola. It had the simple split hatch that comes down with the periscope in the middle of it. This is far better. I mean, not, not ideal by modern standards, but by World War II standards, this is one of the best cupolas you're gonna get. As you move around to the back, we see rations. Packaged by Patton Food Products, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ration type K. Use as a waterproof container for matches, cigarettes, and other items. For security, hide the empty cannon wrappers so they cannot be seen. I'm in a 40 ton tank, you know, a 35 ton tank, and they're worried about seeing wrappers. The radio behind them is either an SCR 508, 528, or 538, all things depending. And this is a 20 frequency set. You can listen on 20 and speak on 10. They're selectable. You, program, you spend your time ahead of time programming your crystals, and then you use the push buttons to select whichever frequency it is that you want to transmit it on or monitor. Pretty similar to the way we have things today. That's pretty much it for the commander seat, and next I'm going to move forward to the gunner. Well, we're here, uh, let's talk elephants again, and that means the gun. 75mm M3 was familiar from the M3 medium. It wasn't a low velocity gun, it wasn't really a high velocity gun, it was sort of in the middle, general purpose. But still, one of the best things that the Americans had at the time. In fact, since it was developed from the 1897 gun, which mounted uh, on the M3 half track, the tank destroyer of the time, uh, you ended up with the surprising to some situation that the Sherman actually had a better gun than the tank destroyer. Marginally, but there you go. Uh, that's, that's another long story you'll see in my videos, but yes, tanks were supposed to kill tanks. Now at this point of the war course, the Americans started solving a lot of their ammunition problems that they had had with the M3 medium. So at this point now you have armor piercing high explosive, you have shot, you have high explosive, you have uh, smoke white phosphorus. All very useful. The AP round, the M61, that was rated for about 3.6 inches at muzzle of RHA or 4 inches of face hardened uh, under Navy criteria. This in practice meant that uh, although you could knock out a Panzer III or a Panzer IV if you could hit it at pretty much any range, unless you got a good flank shot on a Tiger, uh, or at least a reasonable shot on a Panther, about the best you could do would just be to batter it into submission. Which in all fairness actually happened with uh, surprising frequency. Anyway, uh, that was the end of the options for the Americans. They did try in August of 1941 starting a program to mount a 3-inch high-velocity cannon. However, the gun was just too big, too heavy. Solution B was to take the 76mm, which had just been developed, uh, found on the M18 Hellcat, and put that in here. So they stuck it in, it worked, ordnance signs off on it, hooray, and an order of a thousand is made uh, to be ready for the invasion of North Africa in late 1942. This was all well and good until Armored Force actually got a hold of one of the prototypes and they took a look at it and said, no, we don't want it. It is too cramped, it is too inefficient, the sights aren't good, yada yada. So they nixed it and they told them to try again and well, they ended up being the T-23 turret which I hope to come across again in some future uh, episode on a late model Sherman. The uh, two exceptions did happen. One was the British that stuck the 17 pounder into this and you know it's cramped enough here with the 75 I can't imagine what they, uh, what they thought of the 17 pounder especially if they thought the 76 was bad. The other was after the war uh, under the MDAP program the Americans refitted 
some of these tanks with 76mm guns anyway and gave them to allies. And, you know, crew efficiency be damned, they were going to get these tanks. They wanted some tanks. Uh, the most famous of these could be found in the movie Kelly's Heroes. If you look at them, they're 76mm Shermans with these small turrets. The loudspeakers are optional. So anyway, that's about enough on the guns. Uh, we're going to come back to that probably, as I say, in a future Sherman episode, assuming I can find one. Uh, in the meantime, let's move on to the controls. Now, the gunless seat itself is actually quite comfortable. My left foot is comfortably resting on the two foot triggers. My right foot is a little bit underneath the manual traverse, but it's protected by the skeletonized turret basket rim. So it stops my feet from getting crushed as the turret traverses. Under power traverse control, of course, being down here, a full circle would be about 24 seconds. If you wish, you could go to a manual traverse mode, as it is now disconnected by pushing down on this release lever. You now go into an actual manual traverse mode, which is fairly quick. Let's go back up. Elevation. Well, of course, you have the manual elevation control option here. Reasonably quick. But better yet, just like on the M3, you can disconnect the elevation gearing and now your gun is very well balanced. And it can be used in a stabilized mode. Now why would you do this? Well, obviously so that you can get the target into your sights quicker as you're moving cross country. Speaking of sights, originally the only one that came with a tank was a periscopic one through the turret roof. It was Periscope M4 with Telescope M38. And as you can see, there's the wide field of vision on the left side. And when you have your target more or less in the middle, you can then look with your right eye through the telescope, which is a by 1.4 and has a reticle in it. Fantastic. Now, why would you do this as opposed to having a direct vision uh, scope such as this one? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, it allows you to have that really wide field of vision, which is very important for acquiring the target. He sees the enemy first, will probably shoot first, and probably win. The other advantage is that if your sight is going through the roof, you can spot the enemy without exposing your turret. And so you can stay hidden, keep an eye out, and away you go. However, there is a couple of problems as well. The linkages between the periscope and the gun, which has been unfortunately removed on this, they weren't the most reliable and it took a while for a field modification to come out that actually really kept the sights aligned. In the long run, the solution was to install a direct vision scope as well. Now this was originally the M55, wasn't well received, they updated it to the M70F. Now this gave you some additional capability. Firstly, it was a by 3 optic instead of the by 1.4. So arguably this would have become the primary sight de facto. But imagine what this does now for your engagement speed. If you're in a turret down position in ambush waiting for the enemy to show up, you can be scanning around looking with your periscope. You see a target, you lay on it, you're in stabilized mode. But you're still behind the berm. You cannot engage the target because if you press fire, you're going to hit the dirt right in front of you. Driver move out. You then move your head to the direct vision uh, site with the stabilizer engaged as soon as the gun has cleared the berm that you're hiding behind or the hill crest, whatever, driver stop. You are already on the target, it's in your sights because of the stabilizer system. You now know you've just cleared the berm so you can shoot quickly, take the shot, probably fire a second shot, fall back behind cover, return to your wide view optic and start the process over again. This was a level of capability that no other tank had in the world in 1942-1943. Uh, well, okay, 43 by the time you add these things in. And indeed it was pretty much unique through to until the Korean War. Centurion finally uh, came along. Other things in the guns compartment, well, you've got the rear stat for the uh, stabilizer system. There's a azimuth indicator down here for indirect fire, so this will give you the line of bearing horizontally. For elevation, you'd use a gunner's quadrant and simply place it onto the breech block. Other than that, this is a comfortable position, very ergonomically well designed. The gunner can get the most out of this tank. That done, let's go on to what I'm going to assume is a slightly less pleasant position, the loaders.
As you come over to the Lotus side, there's bad news and good news. Well, the bad news I've already mentioned, the lack of a hatch. In order to get here, I've had to come under the recoil guard, and I can only assume things get more difficult if the gun is in elevation. Fortunately, in depression, it gets much better, and I think if your tank was knocked out, it's probably the more likely direction it will be in. The good news, though, is once you're in here, it's actually very roomy. Uh, I am sitting on his seat. It's not in the way at all. There's ventilation up here, and I have visibility through the rotating and elevation adjustable periscope. Two inch smoke bomb thrower is to his left. Originally, this was a British request. The Americans eventually got it in. There used to be a pistol port back here. Now, this was deleted in April 43. It wasn't deemed necessary. The crews objected to this. They deemed it was necessary. And so later on uh, in production, the pistol port was added back in again after a brief absence. Ammunition. 97 rounds of 75 millimeter were available to him. And it was stowed pretty much all around the track. Uh, the sequence of events for taking the ammunition was first he took it from the ammo box under the gun, then it will be the front right sponson, then it will be underneath the turret, and then it will be the right rear sponson. And the idea was that the two or three rounds that were actually in clips, there, there was no clips here, but there would be, they were extreme emergency only. The default was that you were going to take it out of the box and you know, that was deemed to be fast enough. Now, you have your questions to whether or not that is true, but actually it's not that bad. So if you will bear with me for one moment while I demonstrate, you and note I'm doing all this from the seated position. Come down, you lift up the ammo bin lid. So you probably do this once at the beginning of the action. Once that's out of the way, you Lift up the retaining clips of the ammunition, so I now have four rounds easily available to me. Lean down, grab the round. I now have a 75 millimeter round. Place it into the breech, which is closed on this tank, so I can't actually do it. And then throw the round all the way into the gun. Now, again, this is... I, I can't remember the last time I was in a World War II tank like this, and I could load the gun all eight ready, you know, all eight rounds, or plus the ones in the clip, maybe ten rounds, from the seated position. This, this is wonderful. If only they had thought to put a damn door in the uh, in the turret. They actually are called doors. We call them hatches by uh, by default, but technically they're doors. Also, technically, the loader is known as the cannoneer. Although I've never ever met anybody who refers to the loader as a cannoneer in routine operation. 4,700 rounds of caliber 30 would be fitted. Of course, the caliber 30 coaxial to the main gun here. And he has his control up here for the spotlight that we had talked about earlier. That's pretty much it for the loader side. Uh, this would be a wonderful position to be in after October 43. Uh, otherwise, uh, the oh my god, the tank is on fire test, I think immediately from this is going to be a fail. Now move to the front of the hull, the driver's position. I am now in the up position, so I can drive open hatched easily enough. And of course the seat will down to a much more reasonable position for driving with hatch closed. Okay, so this hatch unfortunately is not complete. It's not gonna lock all the way down, but you can get a general idea of the situation. So my left foot, of course, is gonna be on the clutch. It's a reasonably heavy clutch. Unfortunately, on this particular tank, I've seen other tanks that the clutch is very light. So it seems to be a matter of, well, just how much is the tank used. I've driven Germans before. Trust me, this is not normal. Uh, he has two optics to look at. Uh, firstly, he has the traditional rotating adjustable elevation directly in front. Should something happen to this, he can move to an auxiliary further forward, but that doesn't rotate or elevate at all. For controls, the traditional two tillers. And if she pulls it back, there's a rocker down here, which engages or disengages the ratchets, which also turn it into the bargaining brake. So pull back both uh, tillers, 
pull up on the rocker, the parking brake has now been engaged. And now disengaged. Accelerator, low on the right, not a problem there, fuel primer pump. Gear shift is now to his right. Remember on the M3 medium, the driver sat astride the gearbox, no longer on the M4. So he has quite a simple system, your traditional manual transmission on the right. No particular issues there. Uh, you do see also they have here the windshield for the driver. So if he's driving in a low threat environment, but it's wet or something like that, he puts up this driver's hood, which gives him protection from the wind and the rain. Very nice. It even comes with a uh, windshield wiper to keep the rain out. The control panel on the left, uh, this is pretty much typical with the light switch on the far left. Fuel cut off is how you turn off the engine. The magnetos uh, are left, right, or both. Uh, and of course, you would boost and start. This control mechanism really doesn't change throughout most of the Army's tanks from the 1930s to the 1950s. And in fact, you still see headlight switches still more or less the same today. Auxiliary fuel pump when you need it, and your additional normal array of uh, amperes, voltmeter, RPMs, taps out at 3500, you see that there's no red line. There should be a red line because it shouldn't really go if I recall over 2800, uh, but there is no red line. Miles an hour goes up to 80. There's optimism. And temperature gauge, low oil pressure light, and of course, circuit breakers. This is an easy vehicle to drive. The, the fact that you don't need the double clutch is very nice. It's not quite as good as an automatic transmission, but if you gotta have a manual, and I do like driving manuals, uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, that is pretty much everything I'm gonna say about the driver's side. I will now move over to the bow gunner. Moving over to the bow gunner. Um, the first thing I will note is that the hatch actually works on this. So it's easily enough locked into place by use of this little screw system. No particular problems there. All right, we'll come back to that. His primary toy is the Browning 1919 A4 in a simple ball mount. To aim it, he simply follows his tracers by use of the periscope, either the rotating elevating one in the driver's, uh, the bow gunner's hatch, or the fixed one for the Ford. And there's, there's a couple of spare periscopes mounted around as well, of course, should they get shot up. The utility of the bow machine gun is questionable. Uh, it, was, it looks like it was retained simply because when the tank was moving, it was the most accurate system on the tank, if you didn't have a stabilizer. And you know the stabilizer I've gone into before, the stabilizer actually worked very well if you happen to be a member of a crew who knew how to use it. Unfortunately, it was so secret they didn't teach anybody how to use it. Go figure. Other parts around the tank. Uh, there is ammunition stowed on the right here behind this little uh, plate for the Ford, where we now have a storage compartment. Would otherwise go an SCR 506 radio if this was a command tank. Uh, in American service, of course. Now, down at my feet is one of your big indicators of a Grizzly versus a, an American-produced Sherman. It is a small hatch, which is designed for deploying the Snake Anti-Mine System. Don't ask me what it is, but that is what it is for. The Canadian tanks had this, the American ones did not. There is a proper escape hatch further to the rear. And as far as escape hatches go with the period, it's not small. Uh, it's a uh, reasonable size, I mean, compared to, say, the Matilda from earlier, or even the T-34. This is something you can probably get out of even if you're wearing winter kit. So, a point there. The transmission oil is checked down here through this little uh, filler port, and that's pretty much it. There remains one more test. This is, again, the small hatch Sherman. Now, the thing about Shermans is that although they have a re reputation of being death threat traps, they weren't. Uh, on average, uh, the Americans found that they lost maybe 0.6 of a person per killed tank. Uh, the survivability rating of this tank was higher than pretty much any other tank on the battlefield. 
per knocked out tank. And part of the reason for it is, once they fix the loader's hatch issue, which I think I mentioned before, uh, getting out of a Sherman is really, really easy. Uh, bear in mind, this is the small hatch Sherman. So I will try the, oh bugger, the tank is on fire test with a small hatch Sherman and well, let's see how I do. Now, one last point I'll note before I conduct the test is that there is a minor cheat. In 1943, they started issuing spring kits. Uh, before that, the tank to open up the doors, you were fighting against a full weight of the hatch. However, come 43, someone decided let's put springs on it, make it much easier to open and get out. And this is one of these retrofitted tanks. Of course, off the production lines, they were added as well. So, without further ado, Oh, bugger, the tank is on fire. <laughs> Try doing that in a T-34 or a Comet. Won't work. So now I'm out, let's close up. Firstly, a note on names. It is, of course, well known that the British, specifically Churchill, came up with the name Sherman for the tank. However, it wasn't until late 1944 that US Army Ordnance finally decided to give it a name of General Sherman. The troops fighting in the front lines didn't really care what US Army Ordnance thought the tank should be named, and they just continued to call it the Medium or the M4. It wasn't until after the war that the name Sherman began in American parlance to be associated with the M4 Medium. When it came out in 1942, this is arguably the best tank in the world. However, there were a couple of glitches. The turret hatches, the optics were the main ones. Still, by 1943, they had started fixing these and it really was an excellent tank. You can argue best, not best, but it was definitely very good. Technology progressed quickly, however. What was world leading in 1942 was much less so in 1944. Fortunately, by this point, the improved Shermans were coming off the production line and they were an entirely different beast. I do hope to do one of these in a future episode, so we'll come back to that then. About 33,000 of the tanks were made, plus an additional 4,600 with the 105 howitzer. Of these, about half of them went to the UK, and an additional 2,000 went to the Soviets. And that's not bad for a country that in the five years prior to the war had only built 100 medium tanks. That was the M4A1 medium, and we'll see you on the next one. Wait proudly high o'er Dublin town, they hung out the flag of war. Twas better to die neath an Irish sky than at Sulvarusud Albar. And from the plains of Royal Mead, strong men came hurrying through. While Britannia's Huns with their long-range guns sailed in through the foggy... How unfortunate we are short for time, so I better get back to work.